Good morning. I'm Hugh Porter, Acting President, and it's my very great pleasure to launch this academic year at Reed College. I would like, in particular, to welcome our new students, their friends, and their families to this campus. We are truly excited to meet you. To our new students, we look forward to learning with you and to your contributions to this community. And my brief remarks are really for you. We talk a lot about scholarly effort here at Reed and rigor and steep, steep climbs. We believe this hard work develops formidable thinkers ready to make significant contributions in their chosen careers. The world does indeed need more Reedies. I am not concerned with your abilities to manage the challenges of Reed education. We have selected you because we are confident you should be here. Four short years from now, I look forward to welcoming you back on this stage, to seeing you here to receive your diploma. I also know you will make the world a better place while you are here and after you graduate from Reed. After all, you chose a place with a sustained commitment to an honor principle. What I want to suggest to you is today is that you also seize this fleeting time for play. We are about to hear from Jan Miskowski, Professor of German and Humanities, on the two rare opportunities I get to hear Jan speak. I'm reminded what a marvel the human mind can be when well furnished with concepts and methodologies that allow us to visualize, to deconstruct, rotate, calculate, and appreciate. The best practitioners of these activities, and we've hired an entire faculty of them, appreciate and understand the importance of intellectual play. This is your opportunity to assemble the tools and disciplines of the liberal arts and sciences for your pleasure as well as your ultimate purpose. The education here is unusually structured because it is designed to build these wide-ranging skills. But we invited you specifically to join us not because, in Ambrose Bierce's definition of erudition, we seek to shake our dusty ideas into your empty skulls. On the contrary, we believe you are essential that your unique and diverse histories will spark better thinking, more effective action, and more fun. It is our work and play together that make this place special. The accuracy and usefulness and currency of ideas must be honed in our interactions with others. So do wander the library stacks, reaching for the book next to the one you were assigned. Do soak in the amazing art all over campus, including Hilda Morris's Wingate sculpture right over there on the lawn. Do sample the wonders of the Pacific Northwest, but most of all, set aside time to enjoy your colleagues on campus, your comrades in the quest for knowledge and your purpose. Playfulness is not frivolous. It is part of your unique contribution, the springboard for true creativity, a critical part of intellectual work, and a force to bind our ever more fractured world together. Welcome to Reed. Good afternoon. My name is Milian Trulov. I'm the Vice President and Dean of Admission and Financial Aid, and it is good to see you all again. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. This is uh, probably uh, one of the most special days of the year when you all arrive here on campus. Uh, I want to take a moment and uh, uh, thank in uh, particular the students who are here from Minnesota. Where are Minnesota students? All right. There we go. Uh, our Minnesota students represent a 300% uh, increase uh, over last year from that particular state. It's from like three to nine, but it's, it's still pretty significant. I think they have an amazing admission counselor. It's me. But uh, welcome, welcome to campus. Um, I've spent a great many years uh, helping students in their college search and figuring out what they want to do. And for each class, I've noticed that each of them has a really unique characteristic, a quality that really differentiates them from all others. Uh, you all, this class is one of the most interesting classes I've ever recruited. And I know what some of you are thinking. Um, is he using last year's speech? 
I'm not. In fact, I write each speech from scratch that presents its own problems. Half of you are probably thinking, um, well, Millian, of course, tell me more about how I'm really great. <laughs> and so um, if you know anything about Reed, it's not about the competition. Uh, I'm sure last year's class was better in some other important way. Perhaps they had a better verbal SAT score. Um, but your SAT scores were not too shabby, uh, and you're differentiated in that way also. Actually, you, along with the class of 2019, are the most ethnically diverse class here at Reed. Thirty-six percent of you identify as U.S. multicultural, and nine percent of our incoming class are international students, and you represent 20 countries. Let's welcome our international students. <laughs> 226 of you are the only one with your name. <laughs> and I'm including all four Madelines because they're all spelled differently. <laughs> ben and Benjamin, William, there are four others who are graced with your name. While most of you are undecided, those who are thinking about English will saturate our first year classes. The next most popular academic programs outside of undecided are physics and then psychology. But I digress, like I said, you're the most interesting and it might be a result of your circumstances in some cases, like one of you who hails from a multiracial family and you were the first child in your state to have both of your mom's names on your birth certificate. A great many of you are musicians, like the new Reedy, who is a member of the psychedelic rock band named Rubenstein Drive-By. <laughs> if you get a chance to listen to his album SoundCloud, it's really good. The first song, and I'll paraphrase, oh crap, the ship is sinking. <laughs> uh, we have another singer who sells uh, her CDs and performs in public venues online. Phoenix is an amazing artist. You're also athletes. I'm suddenly aware that the faculty are shifting in their seats. We did tell them. <laughs> but our new Reedy, who is a Russian Olympiad, our resident trapeze artist, our Colorado State Bowling Tournament finalist, our competitive figure skater, our nationally ranked squash competitor. Now, many of you may not know Peter Steinberger, but I just made his day. <laughs> and I might get a lunch out of this. Uh, many of you are entrepreneurs like the Reedy who owns and owns, who owns and runs his own clothing store here in Portland, the Abance. The Abance, the definition of which a temporary state of inactivity is a consignment store reselling high-end clothing. Or the new Reedy who is a freelance web and app developer who worked with Amazon to create a mobile, uh, mobile game store. But all of you are talented academics, a few of you I'll talk about right now. Some of you write for Socratic.org or are the world finalists in Odyssey of the Mind. Or after winning the regional robotics tournament in Wisconsin, you went on to compete on the world stage. Or perhaps you're the one who created the largest platforms for doctors to share diagnostic data in India after gold medaling in the Indian National Science Fair. You have lived lives advancing the common good. One of you started the largest LGBT organization in Tianjin. And many of you have also lived lives where you've had to struggle to make, it, to make success. Um, whether you, may have been, you may be the unaccompanied minor who's been unaccompanied at, since the age of 15, who's lived with, in your car or with your friends, who would write essays in a laundromat until 3 a.m. and went on to get straight A's. These are your stories. I don't have time to share them all, but every one of you, and I mean this sincerely, every one of you comes with distinct and interesting beginnings, and I encourage you to talk to your classmates and discover as many as possible. You'll start to notice something that I noticed, that you are thoughtful and discerning. You're folks who don't take the first thing you hear for fact. You take time to think about it. You're individuals who are willing to change your mind with more information. This is a personality trait that is in short supply these days. You see the world and the people in the world. You see that they need help, and you are willing to help them. And this I shared with all of your classmates, and it's particularly true of you. You 
are the class that will make us better. You are the class that will make us better. You are all here because you're meant to be here. Welcome to Reed, Reedies. To this year's incoming class, uh, I'll echo Hugh and Milian, welcome. Uh, we're so excited you're here. Uh, as you finish out orientation, and I thought this was later in the week, so sorry about that, uh, and head into your first week of classes, I hope you remember that you have the support of the whole big Reed community behind you. Because uh, Reed can be hard, and that might even be the reason some of you are here. Uh, I know that that was, that was it for me. Uh, but at one point or another uh, in your read career, every one of you will need some help, and there's absolutely no shame at all in struggling at read and asking for that help. Um, but on the flip side, I'm also going to ask you to think about how you can also give that support back to your community. Uh, when you're not in classes, join a club. Uh, there's so many, take advantage of them. Or start one that doesn't exist but should. Uh, volunteer at the pantry, or use it if you need to. Uh, work at the nuclear reactor and help a friend of yours join if they want to as well. Um, ask someone to mentor you or um, become a mentor yourself. And, and there's so much else to enjoy as a member of the Reed community. Uh, you can have fun learning to shoot pool or seeing your favorite comedian for free through Gray Fund. You can learn to rock climb, submit a poem to a campus publication, uh, sample fancy cheeses or one of Just Desserts Fudge Pops. They're real good. Uh, shoot a 24-hour film or ask a professor or staff member to take you out to lunch because they do have funds for that. Um, <laughs> just remember uh, that all of this exists because of the care we have all invested in each other as a community, and I hope that starting now, you'll carry that forward in your years ahead at Reed. Thanks again and welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Nigel Nicholson. I'm a professor of classics here and uh, dean of the faculty. And um, it falls to me to introduce um, today's uh, lecturer, um, my very good friend, um, Jan Miskowski. Uh, Jan is a, a professor of German and humanities. Um, he's been at Reed College for over 20 years now. Um, he's a terrific teacher, uh, whether he's teaching introductory German language, upper level, um, literature and culture, humanities classes, classes in translation, um, literary theory, um, whatever it is. And uh, he's one of the driving forces in the new um, and very successful comparative literature uh, major. Um, his insights are always uh, challenging and really push his students um, uh, and indeed actually uh, his colleagues um, to think deeply about the world and its works. He's a very distinguished academic um, he's the author of many articles and, uh, and three books. Um, two of these uh, um, books, uh, they're already out. They're very challenging. They're very thoughtful. Um, the first one, Labors of the Imagination, um, Aesthetics and Political Economy from Kant to Althusser, uh, was published by Fordham in uh, 2006. The second one, Watching War, was published by Stanford in 2012. And uh, the third is appearing this winter, uh, with, with uh, the University of Chicago Press, uh, and it's called Crises of the Sentence. Um, the second book, Watching War, um, has made Jan uh, something of a talking head. He's in a lot of demand on, on the lecture circuit right now, including at a lot of places where perhaps um, read professors don't often end up, uh, such as military colleges, which is fascinating. Um, but this, uh, uh, you know, as a scholar, Jan is... is uh, the level of his productivity is truly amazing. Um, he's an academic who sort of operates at, at full capacity. Um, I'm struggling to think of some more production metaphors because these are the kinds of things that Jan loves to pick at and jump on. Um, but I should probably just pass the podium on to Jan, who will be lecturing, us, lecturing uh, to us today on the imagination.
The first 10 seconds of a talk are always the most exciting because everyone in the audience is asking themselves that question, am I going to listen to this guy or am I going to read Twitter? <laughs> you can follow along on the slides if you're so inclined. The cultural theorist Frederick Jameson has argued that today it is easy, easier for us to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Now, on the one hand, the remark speaks to the seeming inescapability of the reigning economic system, the sense that there is no coherent alternative to the status quo. On the other hand, Jameson's comment may say something about the weakness of our imaginations. Perhaps we simply aren't that skillful when it comes to envisioning alternative realities. But the question I want to ask, and this is really the most interesting question I'm going to ask in the whole talk, so if you get bored, just think about this. How easy is it to know how easy is it to imagine something? Indeed, how easy is it to know if you can imagine something at all? Now, there's nothing unusual about saying, I can imagine what that might be like, or I can't imagine what that would be like. But I want to stress to you today, it's not obvious at all what kinds of claims these are. And it's definitely not obvious how confident you can be that you're right when you say them. Now, saying I can imagine X is definitely not the same thing as saying I know X, but it's obviously not really the opposite either. Yeah. Sorry. So, and, and this difference between sort of saying I know X is not the opposite of saying I, I you know, don't know X, this becomes more obvious when someone says I can only imagine, as in I can only imagine what it's like to go to the moon. I've never been to the moon, I can only imagine. Now here, exercising the imagination means engaging with a realm that was never present to you in any direct way. You are speculating. You obviously can't be sure you know what it's like to be on the moon, but you imagine that you can imagine what that's like. And this will continue as you see. Now, if knowing, if knowing and imagining are at least potentially at odds, then saying that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism, that turns out to be a very precise claim about some very imprecise activities. Now, perhaps this should not be a surprise. As a faculty of creation, the imagination routinely confronts us with things that, by definition, we've only barely begun to process. The imagination allows us to concoct what until now had literally been unthinkable or impossible, and that can be a new way of solving a math problem, staging a scene in a play, or something grand like reconciling the, the demands of freedom and equality. All of these things weren't possible until the point that someone concocted them. Now, the crucial thing is the imagination allows you to conjure up all sorts of things about which nobody knows anything, including the person imagining them. As a result, the imagination is always at risk of proving to be a very dangerous, ungovernable force. It inexorably sets processes in motion that nobody can foresee. Now, when you realize that you were coming to a talk about the imagination to be given by a literature professor, you may have sighed a little bit. And you thought, ah, I'm going to hear something vague about inspiration and creativity and the power of the muse or something like that. You may still be worrying this. You may have supposed that I was going to talk about the figure of the artistic genius, some dazzling individual with some sort of super brain that generates revolutionary paintings, groundbreaking novels, or pioneering physics formulas. It's important to realize, however, that if the imagination designates the faculty of the mind that allows people to produce new and novel things, the imagination is also what makes it possible for us to go outside of ourselves. So we are all familiar with the cliché of the dreamy poet in the meadows lost in her musings about clouds and flowers, and she occasionally interrupts these reveries to grab a pen and dash off a sonnet or something like that. But I want to stress today that the very thinkers, the 18th and 19th century thinkers who created this paradigm of the solipsistic genius, these same people consistently maintained that as much as the imagination is about unilaterally bringing things into the world, the imagination is also essential for relating to other people. In this regard, one of the defining claims of the imagination is, I can imagine what you're going through, or I can imagine how you must feel. Without, without the imagination, there can be no sympathy or empathy. Far from inherently egocentric, 
your imagination constantly exposes you to frames of reference in which you are not the centerpiece. The imagination thus lays the groundwork for friendship, love, morality, and politics. Now let me hasten to add that the results are by no means harmonious. You probably will not offend or read freshmen if you tell them that you can imagine how hard it is to get through orientation week. But you may very well raise some eyebrows if you tell somebody that you can imagine what it must have been like to experience the challenges they endured because of, say, gender, class, or ethnicity. As much as the social and the cultural are about the common and the shared, they're also about protecting the integrity, even the uniqueness of one's own ideas and experiences. So we thus come full circle back to the problem of not being sure what you can or can't imagine, except now we see that there's an irreducibly political dimension to any claim to be able to imagine something. You may even decide that the border between what can and can't be imagined is something that has to be policed lest anyone get the idea that their imagination lets them stray into territories where others feel that they have no right to be. All of this is to say that if the imagination is a mainstay of modern aesthetics, the imagination is no less central to modern ethical and political discourses. Now at this juncture, you may feel that I'm trying a little too hard. Listen to the literature professor reassure us that the poets are relevant. Doesn't he sound a tad defensive? If you are regular readers of the New York Times, then I'm sorry for you. <laughs> I, I can only imagine what that must be like. <laughs> if you do read the Times, if you do read it occasionally, you may have seen a recent op-ed piece by Ross Douthat about the decline of the humanities. And in this piece, Douthat comments on some of the ways that he thinks humanists are trying and failing to save their fields. Here's our quote. In a society increasingly invested in technical mastery and increasingly indifferent to memory and allergic to tradition, the poet and the novelist and the theologian struggle to find an official justification for their arts. And both the turn toward radical politics and the turn toward high theory are attempts by humanists in the academy to supply that justification to rebrand the humanities as the seat of social justice and a font of political reform, or to assume a pseudo-scientific mantle that lets academics claim to be interrogating literature with the rigor and precision of a lab tech doing dissection. Isn't what this columnist is describing a perfect example of what I am doing this morning? Here I am up here in a desperate effort to justify the continued study of poetry and drama. If I start talking about rigor and precision, will I be embodying precisely the pseudo-scientific posture that is being critiqued here? Now, I want to suggest to you that the problem with this columnist's pseudo-intellectual argument it <laughs> keep it, catch up faster. <laughs> the problem with the argument is that it assumes that the humanities are essentially apolitical. And hence, it assumes that concerns of power and ideology and so forth, they have to be imported into the humanities or grafted onto it as if they were somehow extrinsic to it. But what, what if art and literature and religion do not exist in some magical autonomous realm outside of the social and the political? What if, to the contrary, there is no such thing as the social or the political absent artistic, literary, or religious dynamics? Now, if you actually go and look at the work of 18th and 19th century authors, and we're going to look at one in a second, but if you go and look at the work of 18th and 19th century authors who formulated modern aesthetic doctrines, you will discover two things. First, these authors who formulated ideas about art and creativity and genius, they are the same people who formulated many of the core ideas of modern ethical and political thought, exactly the same people. And the second thing is if you pick up one of these texts and start reading it, you will quickly find that it's simultaneously dealing with art and politics and religion and linguistics and history and potentially other topics as well. In other words, I could give you a lot of these books and I'd say, okay, what class do you read this in? What division do you read this in? And you would have no idea. Writers such as Rousseau or Kant or Adam Smith were all doing today what looks to us like thoroughly interdisciplinary work. But the reason it looks like that to us is because they didn't have anything like the disciplinary models that we have. In fact, if academic institutions had evolved along slightly different lines, 
all our maps of the various fields of study would look completely unfamiliar. And this is no less true for the sciences than for the humanities and the social sciences. And in fact, you could even argue in some ways that, that read some of our new interdisciplinary programs are actually an effort to go back to the way people studied things at the end of the 18th or early 19th century. So they are newfangled precisely by being old-fangled, as it were. Now then, in this context, the reason I look at the concept of the imagination is that it's very hard to decide when the imagination is doing what we would call aesthetic work and when the imagination is doing a different sort of labor. In other words, the imagination makes it very obvious how sort of flimsy a lot of these classificatory categories are. For instance, in 2009, the British Academy made a report to the Queen. And in their report, they tried to explain to the Queen how it was possible that the British banking system had almost completely broken down one year prior. As they wrote to the Queen, in summary, your majesty, the failure to foresee the timing and severity of the crisis and to head it off, while it had many causes, was principally a failure of the collective imagination of many bright people, both in the country and internationally, to understand the risks to the system as a whole. Now notice here that collectivity is specifically a matter of collective imagination. Group think is group imagining. And the assumption of this report is that the proper use of the imagination should make it possible for us to anticipate and thereby alter future outcomes. Notice also what the Royal Academy's report does not say. Namely, it does not say that the global financial crisis was a result of greed, a willingness to break the rules, or just outright disregard for other human beings' welfare. These may all be variables that have to be contended with, but the assumption of this report is if the imagination is working correctly, these other contingencies shouldn't be sufficient to fundamentally disrupt things. In this respect, among other things, this Royal Academy report confirms that quote I began with, Jameson's sense, that today it's very difficult to imagine the end of capitalism. So they imagine the imagination is what's going to save capitalism or keep it running well. It's not going to change it. Now, I want to it stress that this, this report is not unusual. And so to make this point, I'm going to now turn to a different report. This is the official report to the US Congress made by the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Commission was a bipartisan group of politicians, and they were charged with explaining how the events of September 11, 2001 could possibly have taken place. And one of the main explanations their report offers is a failure of imagination. No one ever thought creatively about what people could do with planes once they'd taken them over. Everyone just assumed that hijackers would go on having the aircraft land on one runway or another as they had always done before. How unimaginative. Now, the 9-11 Commission was well aware that their invocation of the imagination might seem a little out of place, perhaps more appropriate for a poetry seminar than a government report on a devastating terrorist attack. As they observed, imagination is not a gift usually associated with bureaucracies. It is therefore crucial to find a way of routinizing, even bureaucratizing, the exercise of imagination. <laughs> Keep in mind, this is not someone's straight email. This is the official report. <laughs> now, there's much you could say about this injunction. It is crucial. But one striking thing is that just like the Royal Commission's report to the Queen, the idea is specifically that to avert disaster, we have to be able to see the future, and the imagination should allow us to do this. Now, why do these groups, these official groups, believe this is possible? Are they just wildly optimistic? Or is there something about our collective relationship to the world that makes it plausible that the kinds of events which they're worrying about could have been anticipated and thus avoided? Now, in fact, I want to argue that neither of these reports is saying anything out of the ordinary. And I say this because our entire economic system is predicated on the assumption that peoples and groups will regularly take very concrete positions on what will or won't happen in the future. Given the nature of competition and the credit system, an economic agent in a market economy is always focused on tomorrow. She's constantly thinking about potential gains and losses. She's thinking about the good things that will happen if she comes up with something innovative and about the bad things that will happen if her competitors prove more imaginative than she is. 
the cell phone you've been selling is great until Steve Jobs comes out with a much slicker one. And yes, there is a mandatory, sort of obligatory Steve Jobs reference in all read talks. <laughs> I'm not even sure why that's funny, but. In the capitalist system, competition demands that you routinely deal with imagined futures. As the sociologist, uh, sociologist Jens Beckert puts it, capitalism is anchored in the unique human ability to imagine future states of the world that are different from the present. And this is why economics is such a weird field of study, and I can say this because I'm the son of an economist, so I'm authorized to make such comments, but economics is a weird field of study because you know, we're accustomed to analyzing the present and treating it as an outcome of the past, but to understand what's going on today, economists have to reason backwards from the future. So the question is then, if capitalism is the most powerful force in our society, and if it's the most powerful driver of the exercise of the imagination, do we have a conception of the imagination that isn't itself essentially capitalist? Maybe part of the reason that it's so hard to envision alternative to capitalism is that market competition has come to define what we understand by creativity. Still, you might say, wait a minute, though. You began your talk by saying that whatever we want to say about the imagination, we can be confident that nothing can completely control it. And that would suggest that not even the dominant global system of wealth generation is the imagination's sovereign master. So to offer a few thoughts on this about whether the imagination is entirely controlled by capitalism, I want to close by talking briefly about Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, which was published 200 years ago in 1818. Now, as you probably know, Frankenstein is a book about how one Dr. Frankenstein manages to bring to life a quasi-human entity. And this entity quickly matures and becomes the most compelling character in the novel. Many people would say the most human entity in the novel is this creation. The creature is certainly the best storyteller. When this creature starts telling stories, you really listen. The creature is the best narrator. And it's, of course, also the book's most fearsome and efficient killer. Now, for the third edition of Shelley's text, her publishers asked her to explain to her readership where she got the bizarre idea. And, and this was, of course, this highly chauvinistic thing of sort of, you know, how did a young teenage girl come up with this crazy story? That's literally what they wrote. She said, I will tell you. And if you're feeling competitive, she wrote this book when she was 19, so. <laughs> Any case, where did she come up with this crazy idea? She tells a story, she says, she's going to bed, she's trying to go to sleep, but when I placed my head on my pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. My imagination unbidden possessed and guided me, gifting the successive images that arose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. I saw, with shut eyes but acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out. And then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful it must be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his odious handiwork, horror-stricken. Now, this will probably sound to your ear like a very conventional, almost cliched description of the power of the poetic imagination. Shelley writes of being completely gripped by a vision. She doesn't have to plan or plot. No thinking at all is required. She's just moved. We might understand her remarks as an invitation to read her novel as an allegory of artistic creation. Just as Dr. Frankenstein fashions a terrible creature, so Shelley wrote a terrifying tale. And in fact, in one of the book's republications, Shelley specifically said, and now, once again, I bid my hideous progeny, that is my book, I bid my hideous progeny go forth and prosper. So she very much encourages the idea that you think of her book as her monster. Even in her own time, however, this description of trying to go to sleep and instead being beset by a vision for her book, this was going to sound a little bit artificial, right? It's almost sort of too good to be true. And this seems to say that the best testimony she can make to the power of the imagination, namely her book, that testimony itself sounds overtly fanciful. It's as if this tale of the origin of her ideas is just as much a confabulation as the rest of her ideas. 
Now, interestingly, Mary Shelley was not the only person who tried to tell us how to read and interpret her book. Her husband, Percy Shelley, wrote the preface to the first edition of the book. And in it, in the preface, he tried to give the plot an air of scientific credibility. So he name drops all these famous scientists' names. And then he immediately says, but I don't want you to think I'm implying anyone's actually invented life. So on the one hand, Shelley's worried that his wife's book is going to seem too imaginative. But at the same time, he doesn't want to give the impression that it's nonfiction or something like that. Now, I want to suggest that the very fact that he would waffle on this point points to a basic tension that structures Frankenstein. So on the one hand, in the course of the narrative, a great deal of effort goes into detailing the facts and the processes surrounding the doctor's research. This good doctor is very much, he's an empirical scientist. He respects established laws and paradigms, and he follows rigorous methods. And in fact, in writing her story, Shelley explicitly drew on contemporaneous knowledge about electricity and the nervous system and so forth. In other words, if the mad scientist is a genius poet, he's also a genius researcher. On the other hand, there's no question that myth and folklore, alchemy, and of course dreams play an important role in this story. Imaginary elements quite literally run amok throughout the tale. And at any given point, anyone who's narrating is always under suspicion that they're making up some of what they're saying. Maybe the lesson is that we don't need to oppose Dr. Frankenstein, the inspired artist, and Dr. Frankenstein, the empirical researcher. Maybe Shelley's doctor can be both, because maybe these two roles aren't nearly as different as we tend to assume today. In fact, I would go further and argue that it's precisely because Shelley's novel is not organized around some sort of simplistic art-science dichotomy that the book has so much to offer on so many different topics. With the rigor of a lab tech doing dissection, to quote our New York Times columnist, with the rigor of a lab tech doing dissection, the novel Frankenstein provides a systematic meditation on many of the most pressing questions about class, race, and the legacy of colonialism that we still face today. Dwelling on the uncertain relationship between corporeality and identity, the book uncannily echoes many contemporary debates in gender and sexuality studies. And much of what Shelley's text has to say about the implications of technological change for the fate of the family could scarcely seem more relevant. In short, if Frankenstein was written 200 years ago, it doesn't appear to have dated a single day. It's as if Mary Shelley, the good capitalist, had done a wonderful job of predicting the future. We might surmise that this is an indication that some things don't change that much, at least not in 200 short years. If the ideological questions that preoccupy us also preoccupied early 19th century Europeans, this is presumably because the same capitalist imperialist system is still very much alive and kicking. I don't want to leave you, however, with the notion that there's nothing new under the sun. At any given point in time, our ideas about what it means to be a sexual or gendered being, a viable economic or political agent, or simply our ideas about what it means to be a sentient creature, all of these ideas are constantly being renegotiated, which is to say that they are constantly being reimagined. As I hope my remarks this morning have suggested, this means that our most pressing political debates will to a large extent always be arguments about what we can and cannot imagine. Now years of experience at Reed have taught me never to underestimate the imaginative capacities of Reedies. Speaking now directly to the freshman class, I'll tell you that I think it's entirely possible that one of you may one day imagine a viable alternative to capitalism. I certainly hope that some of you will help imagine some alternatives to the end of the world. <laughs> and, and quickly, wouldn't this be? <laughs> For better or worse, however, I am less confident than any of you are going to imagine an alternative to the imagination. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, as the chief administrator, I think the bureaucratization of imagination will be my first duty here this year. 
when I'm not imagining what it's like to be Jan's student, which envious there. So special thanks to all of those who worked so hard to make this event possible, and to all of you in attendance for your attention, to parents, extended families, and supporters of our new students. Later this week, Friday, in fact, I deliver my youngest child to another liberal arts college about as far away from this Portland as you can get. Having done this before, I hope I'm better, as Julia Lithcott Hames would tell me, at letting go, but I'm not so sure that's going to work out. Rest assured, you and your student have made a great choice in Reed College. I don't think there's any better place to grow and to learn. To our new students, when we are concluded here in just a minute, um, please gather in front of Elliott Hall for a large group photo taken by an intrepid photographer on top of the building, so look up. And with that, our convocation is concluded and our academic year has begun. Thank you. Thank you.